Good afternoon. My name is Alex Abizaid. A warm welcome to discuss two very fascinating technologies. And I have an amazing panel to help me to dissect into these two platforms. One is going to be a stand platform with novel technology. And then the second half of our discussion today will be about uh, a novel drug coating balloon. So I think that uh, 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 these people here, that they don't need any introduction, but very qu quickly on my left, I have Marco Vajimiglik, who will uh, be the co-moderator. He's going to be doing most of the animated discussion. And then, on, of course, on my right, I have Professor Sarais, Patrick Sarais, now from Ireland, right? You, with a different accent, perhaps. <laughs> Dr. Malik and uh, Sandeep, I'm not going to dare to pronounce your last name. Uh, Marco is going to do that. And Luca Testa. So uh, I, I will introduce uh, the, the first topic very briefly, which is going to be about uh, the, uh, a novel technology on the stand platform. That is, uh, can you progress with the first slide, please? So I already made the introduction for uh, the panelists. And, uh, and, and this is the agenda. Uh, the main objective, as I mentioned to you, is to discuss uh, this novel DS technology. And immediately after that, we're going to move to a balloon technology, uh, both with very unique features that is probably going to be highlighted as something that can change our practice and improve <coughs> outcomes. Since we're going to start uh, with Abiluminus, uh, it's my charge in these next two minutes just to summarize the main features of this new stand platform. Uh, first of all, it's a very thin strut. There will be no debate that uh, most of the novel technology is moving to thinner strut technology. I think we all agree that we can cause less injury, we can cause less sheer stress, and, 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 and there is no debate about moving to, uh, towards a thinner struts, and this is how we compare Abiluminus to the competitors. But the most important features are described in this slide. It's again a unique combination of a DES that releases Sirolimus to the vessel wall, so not to the lumen, to the vessel wall, but also with a, a balloon that releases drug releases Sirolimus as well. So it's a combination of a DCB with a DES, a higher concentration at the drug at both edges to avoid edge restenosis, and particularly very, very interesting for diabetic population that we all know that will have more intimal hyperplasia, more proliferation, and again, we're going to leave less gap of a uh, drug that is not going to be in contact to the vessel wall. So I think combining the struts that will touch the vessel wall, the releasing drug with a novel technology with balloon, can really be um, a, a fascinating technology for diabetic population. Again, Marco, the word is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. Hello, everybody. It's my privilege to be participating in this session. Before we get started, I would like to remind the audience that this is going to be a very interactive session. You are entitled and actually you are more than welcome to post your question through the PCR app. And we will do our very best to answer. We have a chat master in charge of it. And also we will bring into the live discussion all the key burning uh, questions that you will be raising. So please don't uh, shy away from this. We are really looking forward to hearing your comments and doing our very best to reply to all your questions. Uh, with that said, I would like to give uh, the word to Fazila for the first case we're going to hear. Friends and colleagues, it's indeed a great honor and privilege for me to be here today. And as we all are aware, cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of morbidity and mortality among people with diabetes worldwide, accounting for 60% of all deaths in diabetes. And the prevalence of diabetes is increasing globally, unfortunately. And it's predicted that by 2035, we'll have around 600 million diabetic patients globally. So just think about the enormity of the problem. 
Now, the diabetic patients, they tend to exhibit an increased risk for development of atherosclerosis for a variety of reasons. And the atherosclerotic burden in the coronary arteries usually tends to be very high. The plaque burden is huge. The vessels are diffusely diseased. And very often, due to this plaque burden, are of narrow caliber. And such was the story for this 42-year-old gentleman who was suffering from chronic stable angina. Obviously, he was diabetic with a preserved ejection fraction of 66%. And this is how his coronaries look like. So his left main looks pretty diffusely diseased. The LED is totally occluded from its origin. The LCX is free of any significant disease. And if you look at the right side, the right coronary artery is a dominant vessel free of disease, and it's giving some collaterals to the LAD. So we talked about the revascularization strategies with the patient. A heart team approach was taken, but our patient was not at all interested about CABG. He wanted a PCI done. So with that in mind, we started with a EBU 3.57 French catheter, and we managed to wire the LED <laughs> with a pilot 50 wire with the help of a fine cross microcatheter. Once we had managed to wire the vessel, we exchanged our hydrophilic wire for a run through floppy wire, and then we proceeded to do pre dilatation with a 2 by 20 millimeter NC balloon. We did a thorough job of pre dilatation. And after pre-dilatation, this is how the vessel looks. So we could see that after, even after intracoronary nitroglycerin, the vessel looks pretty diffusely diseased, huge plaque burden. And we wanted to ascertain the extent of the plaque burden in the vessel. So we went with an IVUS catheter. And sure enough, we saw that the plaque burden was huge. It was extending even up below the, beyond the mid of the LAD. And in the left main, we also saw that there was plaque, and the vessel diameter was only two millimeters, with a huge plaque burden and an area of 4.4 millimeters square. So for this patient, the abluminous drug eluding stent was chosen, and as has already been alluded, this is a stent that is unique in the feature that it has a drug-coated stent along with a a drug eluding stent with a drug coated balloon. And what this translates to is that you have homogeneous delivery of the serolimus from the drug eluding stent as well as the drug coated balloon. And this is ideal for a patient with diabetes with huge plaque burden. It's not homogeneous. Yeah. And so we took a three by four millimeter balloon, the ab abluminous drug eluding stent, we positioned it and we deployed it from the left main to the LAD. Now, ideally, the balloon needs to be inflated up to 45 seconds. But here we were dealing with the left main, so we did two consecutive inflations, 30 seconds each, and we went up to 12 atmosphere in both the instances. The patient tolerated the 30 second inflation well. We then did proximal optimization with a 4 by 12 millimeter balloon. We went up to very high pressure, 20 atmospheric pressure. We wanted to be sure that our stent was properly opposed to the vessel wall. We did post dilatation of the rest of the vessel. And for the rest of the lesion, we chose two consecutive stents, a bluminous drug eluding stent, 2.5 by 20 and 2.25 by 20 millimeter, deployed them and we had the inflation time of 45 seconds for each of the stent. We proceeded to do post-dilatation, and we were very careful to do a proper job of post-dilatation because it's crucial that our stent is properly opposed. There's no under-expansion or malapposition. So after post-dilatation, we did an IVA study of the stents, and we found that the stents were properly opposed. There was no malaposition, no underexpansion. And in the left pane now, the diameter was almost four millimeters with the area of 10.1 millimeters square. This was the final result, and we were 
quite satisfied with this result. We gave our patient advice about optimal um, medical therapy and how to control his diabetes. And it's crucial for a diabetic patient to properly control their diabetes. And he was doing well. However, 45 days later on, he came with some atypical chest pain. There was no troponin rise, but since he was complaining of chest pain, he's a diabetic, we've implanted three stents, we just wanted to be sure. So we did a check angiogram and 45 days follow up and it was it came fine. So this has been more than six months now, he's doing absolutely well. He has his diabetes under better control and I truly believe that in diabetic patients with great pharmacotherapy, with the uh, diabetes control, this is going to be a game changer to help them with long-term great results. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fazil. It was a very nice case that we're going to discuss at the end. So you can uh, reach us at the podium. Now it's my privilege to give the word to Luca Testa, who's going to also follow up Good. with some cases. Good morning, everybody. It's, it's my privilege to, to share with you some time, con well, related to these new technologies. And, um, well, relatively new, I have to say, because I started them all, almost five years ago using this kind of, you know, or new, new kids on the block. These are my, you know, conflict of interest. I'll start directly with a clinical evaluation, talking about an old male, 84 years old, with some comorbidities, as you can see, and risk factors, as usual, this lipidemia type 2 diabetes in particular. It has been referred to our Center for Worsening Dyspnea and Angina in a known severe artery stenosis. For some reason, this patient has been treated before. <laughs> Nevertheless, I mean, it came to our attention showing a severe artery stenosis, an ejection fraction, normal ejection fraction, a mild MR. The AKG was relatively, you know, not normal in this kind of patients because the sunrise rhythm, rhythm and left anterior fascicular block. And the pre-tabular CD scan showed a critical LED stenosis. So we started with the treatment of the aortic stenosis, in particular this, um, well, at that time, there was a more newly available this prosthesis, so we decided to use it. We also used a, a cerebral protection because of a lot of calcium in this patient. And we achieved a nice commissural alignment, so we decided to proceed to PCI. And as you can see, there is a very tight lesion in the proximal LED in particular. Well, it's hard to define a percentage, but I would say it's around 90, 95%. And nevertheless, there's a good flow distally. Anyway, we decided to proceed for PCI. And then it was absolutely impossible to predilate with a, with a normal balloon. So we decided to use something more aggressive in order to, you know, to dilate and prepare this lesion. Of course, this is not the topic to, for calcium or treatment management. Nevertheless, it was a really complex case. And then we needed to use the rotational thorectomy with upsizing the burr up to 1.5 millimeters. Uh, the move is not running, but it's OK. I'll try to run it. Okay, with some resistance, as you can see, because the wire was coming back. And nevertheless, we managed to, to implant, well, to use some of balloon with increasing size. Repeat dilatation has been done with 2.5. And then, uh, after using a delivery, uh, getting a catheter extension, we managed to deliver an abluminous 3 by 32 millimeters, and then post dilated in the proximal part with a 3.5 non compliant balloon. This is the final angel. As you can see, it was pretty reassuring considering all the things. Of course, we can discuss for some time if you want about the management that need LED, but you need to consider and remember that this patient is an 84 year guy and uh, we believed at the time that the treatment of proximal stenosis was probably the best for this patient. And uh, usually best is also the enemy of good. So we did some evaluation more or less. So I let it run because uh, it's uh, relatively short. As you can see, the stent was very well opposed. No, no problems, as you can see. And uh, clearly, in this kind of, let's say, complex lesion, you need to make sure that your stent has been very well opposed and is very well expanded, of course. Otherwise, you significantly increase the risk of having problems after that. I would like to draw your attention to the fact that there was some kind of dissection. And when we, there's a distal dissection, of course, and uh, we can discuss about the chance to see this kind of dissections after stenting, in particular in complex cases, which is absolutely common. But in nine months, the OCT showed that it was completely healed. I'll let it run again, just to point your attention there. As you can see, there was no residual 
dissection of a follow-up after nine months. And it was absolutely interesting because for us, Oh, diabetic patients, old patients with calcified lesions are always, always bad customers in particular for, because the arteries are fragile. I would like to show you the entire OCT follow-up, and uh, I'm sorry, but I don't know why it's going so fast. But anyway, <laughs> it's going very fast. Nevertheless, nevertheless, there's no, I will show you point by point because probably that's the best way. As you can see here, Okay, there's no dissection at the edge. There is no dissection at the proximal edge. So, in other words, we could conclude that the acute performance of the abluminus was reassuring in a complex lesion, those kind of lesions where you hope that your, your stent will perform at the highest level possible, in particular because this lesion was highly calcified. And of course, after the necessary lesion preparation, everything went done. But of course, the, the, the big good news is that the biological interaction between the abluminus and the coronary wall in a diabetic patient seemed encouraging as we observe a full strut coverage, minimal hyperplasia, and a smooth healing process of the observed edge dissection. Thanks for your attention. <clears throat> great, great case, uh, Luca. Um, I have a question for you. Oh, yeah. Um, I, you know, I, 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 I skipped on purpose the two slides that summarizes the clinical program that uh, Concept Medical put together, because Marco is going to present that as well. But one of the major trials, as far as I know, is the one that you are the PI, which is a large registry of close to 3,000 patients on diabetes, yep. on diabetic patients. Can you share with us some of the preliminary results? I know that there is no comparator that will come with a global ability study which is randomized against Zions, but share your thoughts and some of the results on this well, registry. Okay, let me just um, you know, start from the assumption. I mean, we all know that diabetic patients at the moment are still a subgroup of patients where the performance of current generation DES is suboptimal as compared to non-diabetic patients. So that was the rationale for that registry. So we decided to, you know, to collect data for different countries worldwide in a large sample of patients. There's no comparator, but what I can just say today, because we are actually still enrolling, I can say that we are in the range of non-diabetic patients. So in other words, we are treating diabetic patients with these new technologies and the results that we can observe, obviously I'm not talking about the full data set, I'm just talking about preliminary results, which is more or less an impression. Nevertheless, we are in the range of non-diabetic patients, which is, Obviously, something we need to, let's say, reevaluate in randomized control trials. But I know that we were talking about that later on. So at the moment, I can say we need to understand that what we have got today is not enough for patients with diabetes. Apparently, this device can be an answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luca. So just from my understanding, you do just clinical follow-up in this patient, right? It's not Andrew, it's not OCT. So we did see an OCT follow-up here because that patient was at... Yeah, I mean, uh, that was a, a particular case, as you've seen, because we did, you know, we did, we did the TABR, we commissioned alignment, the procedure in the same setting. So we decided to, you know, to have a special care for this patient. And I have to say that we don't do that regularly, otherwise it would be <laughs> possible. But nevertheless, I have, to say, I have to say that, you know, at the end, it was a, a good news to be honest, and I didn't expect, because as you've seen, that stent, that abluminus was actually, you know, angling in a disease, because it was diffuse disease, as usual with diabetic patients. And sometimes you know that a geographic miss, or even the edge of the inside the plaque can be a problem. But as, a, you know, as we know, the presence of the coating at the distal edges might be an answer to the problem of distal stenosis. So. Absolutely. And actually, there is one question coming from the audience addressing sure. specifically this technical point. The question is, you have seen residual uh, disease proximal to the hostile lesion, mainly in the distal left vein, and that lesion was also present at uh, IBUS imaging. So why did you decided to stop at the ostium LED, why not protruding to the left uh, vein? Which it was the... not really at the ostium, Marco. It was... Uh a few millimeters beyond the ostium. And I have to say that um, it was a matter of discussion, obviously, because you always wonder whether you should uh, come back to the le left main when the osteol or proximal LED is involved. But in this case, in this particular case, I have to say that we didn't find an healthy spot to stop with. So in other words, unless you prepare yourself 
to do a very long stenting, which is not the case in my mind. I mean, I don't really like to do that unless you have to. So I, we decided to, to treat the very critical spot. 84 years old, aortic stenosis, diabetic. So, you know, the length of the stents you're putting is a main predictor of the stenosis. So we are trying to minimize the risk of future events. Absolutely. Another technical question from your side, Please. and then perhaps we go back to Fazila's case. Fazila very clearly emphasized the importance of the peculiar technique of stand deployment with this stand technology, whereas you do not go there. Is it also your practice? Oh, yes. How, how do I mean, you use? Uh, oh, well, this is actually coming from the, the past. I mean, when we started using this technology, uh, the strange thing was the you know, duration of the inflation, because, of course, we said, look, okay, this is a, another DES. This is not another DES. You have to consider that this device to, well, to work properly needs to be treated differently. I mean, uh, Alex showed us that it's a combination of a DCB and a DES. Well, okay, <laughs> keeping that in mind. So you need to keep inflated at least 30, 40 seconds, maybe. And uh, if you don't do that, you are treating that device as just another DS, which means that you're not doing the right thing. So in other words, uh, I didn't focus on that because of, I knew that it was actually mentioned before, but clearly, if you want to use that device, you need to remember that you are implanting a DS by means of a DCB. So, Professor Sorais, <clears throat> you've seen so many technologies on, on the top of a DS. Do you think that this is unique? Talk, let's discuss a little bit about uh, the, the, the technology itself. Do you think that this could be transformation in, in which way? I think there is uh, two ways. Of course, the combination of the stent and the drug coating balloon is extending the tissue which is going to be reached by serolimus. Because don't forget that you, in the early days with Cypher, they give you a device Double with dose. two and three times uh, the, the dose of serolimus, and there was no effect on diabetics. So we have to be careful. But here, the surface is much large. Mm -hmm. It's not around the, the struts. For the drug coating balloon, mm -hmm. I think the key point, the, the miss opportunity, but it's coming back, of the bioresorbable is no cage. No caging a vessel is so important because this decade, they are coming with so powerful drug. Mm -hmm. Think about the Inclisiran PCSK9 twice a year. It's like a COVID booth, you know? <laughs> twice a year, you got your subcutaneous and your cholesterol go to 50, uh, plus a thing on the uh, anti-inflammatory. So I think to keep the vessel not caged is very important because it gets access to the plaque, and they, there are no regression of the plaque. I think we will keep busy for a long time with <laughs> the elderly, you know, calcified and so. But the young generation, the young patient, uh, that will be the start of a very aggressive secondary prevention targeting the plaque because the plaque is not caged. Think about it. When you have a plaque outside the stand, you can do whatever you want. It will have no effect on the lumen. That's the key point. That's a very important point. And Vasila, let me go back to, to your case, which was really cutting edge case. Uh, yes, a CTO of LAD in a diabetic patient, yet Sinta score was not terrible. So I think thanks to the work, seminar work that Patrick put together, that patient was a suitable candidate to PCI to me. And you approached that lesion again using state-of-the-art technique with the CTO approach to open the vessel, IVOS to see where the plaque is and how long that should be stented. Uh, and then you use this sort of a modification technique that I had to say I experienced the need for as well. I did uh, quite some many left main cases with that stand, with this Abluminous DS Plus stand, and I, had, I was forced to stop the inflation because after 30 seconds of inflation, there was some hemodynamic instability. You see the pressure going down, down, down. I say, okay, maybe I should stop now the inflation. So is it something you do routinely? Uh, in the left main, or is it just a modification of the technique because of the left main specific location here? Well, actually, it was because of the specific left main situation. And to do a proper job of this drug eluding stent, obviously, we need to inflate it for at least 45 seconds. And here, the patient would not tolerate that. So we did tell the patient that you might experience some discomfort. And if you do, just point to us and we'll... Uh, 
deflate immediately. So he was quite comfortable up to 30 seconds, and then he said that it's uh, so we deflated and we did it for two times. That was just for the left main, but for the other rest of the LED, he tolerated it very well for 45 seconds. Then I have a follow-up question, which perhaps can be a nice way to, uh, in a way, transition towards the second part of the talk. When I saw for the first time your case and seeing you placing a stand proximally, but not starting distally, rather proximally, I thought, okay, there's going to be an hybrid approach, proximal standing plus DCB later on. That's what immediately I got in my mind. But then you kept on with the standing and second standing and third standing. Is it something that was planned? It was a bailout because DCB, perhaps in your opinion, was not a good approach. How do you decide which lesion to stand and which lesion perhaps to try to DCB? Well, actually, uh, here with the IVERS, uh, we had that idea that there was huge plaque burden and we had already identified the length of vessel that we would need to stand. So we were clear that we would go up to where we did and it just made sense to us to sort of safeguard the left main and as it was quite a straightforward vessel to take the subsequent stents. Maybe I, I, I save the last question for you, Marco. Absolutely. So, so in this technology, if you think mechanistically, it's, it's, it, the drug comes from a bioabsorbable polymer. It has nanotechnology also from the balloon. So there is all rationale that three months later there will be no drug behind and no um, polymer. Any, any thoughts about uh, recommendation of how long should we give that for those, those patients? Uh, you know my, my, my thinking about that. I think each stand technology and perhaps even D, each DCB technology should have a dedicated study. Uh, having said that, uh, this technology, of course, it seems to be perfectly suitable for a very short DAPT. But while we speak about DPT, the world is changing. And we, interventional cardiologists, thinking about devices, we should realize that the world is changing into a no DAPT sphere. Mm -hmm. It's not only about DAPT duration, it's about also which type of antiplatelet therapy we continue. So perhaps this technology would be perfect for dropping DPT from the very beginning and starting a monotherapy concept from day one, day two, day three. You cover the pre-procedure -pre phase with aspirin, perhaps just a shot IV as we do in Europe, and then you simply continue with the P2 at 12 inhibitor. I would see this technology, both the stent and the DCB technology, perfectly suitable to go in that direction. But of course, that needs to be investigated. Yeah. So should we move to the... I think it's a wonderful moment to call <laughs> upon our master. Uh, Patrick Serraius is going to give us a, a wonderful talk, which Alex and I had the privilege already to preview. Patrick, the word is yours. Okay, so uh, it's always a privilege to talk uh, with uh, <laughs> such an audience. So this first slide show you the main actors. Uh, they are wonderful investigators who have collected a lot of patients. And then the second row, including the Bernardo Cortez, not Young UA. I think that's a small mistake here. Uh, but that's the people who have uh, analyzed the data that you're going to see. Um, you know, uh, Martin Kaltenbach, I did my very first uh, balloon angioplasty with him in Frankfurt in 79. At that time, he was trying to convince the community that the mechanism of balloon angioplasty is like the footprint in the snow. You extrude the water of the vessel. Now, we know that's not true because by the time we get our first death, you could see that uh, the mechanism of balloon angioplasty is a fracture of the intima with some kind of dehiscence between the media adventitia and the intima. And this is another human death four months later. You could see that there is a, a lot of tissue which has filled that cavity. You still recognize the fractures and you see the restenose in the lumen. Now, it can be even worse. You can have a, a dissection and a matoma. And of course, we were very happy when the stent came because at least is uh, sealing the uh, fracture that you see that at the level of the yellow arrow. 
Now, we have been involved very early in that technology. Look, it's a publication of 2013, that's nine years ago, and you see Pedro Lemos is there, Renu Virmani is there, Manish Doshi is there, which is in the audience, and myself. And what was important is that we look at the penetration of the serolimus, not only in the endothelium after one hour, but in the media, and after seven days, you have the serolimus, which is there in the adventitia. Very convincing uh, mechanism of the magic touch. Now, it's a, probably a new a treatment paradigm, because with the stent, what you do, you cage the vessel. If your QFR is about 0.85, that's not good enough. You should have at least 0.91. And the only thing that can happen is some neointima within the cage. Uh, in the case of drug coating balloon, you could eventually accept a QFR of 0.85 uh, because what happens in some of the cases is a late lumen enlargement and expensive remodeling, and you will have the surprise to see a QFR of 93 six months later. And you keep access to all this wonderful drug that we will have in this decade against the uh, atherosclerosis. So this is uh, the study, the Transform 1 trial. We decided to go for a small vessel, initially 2.5. We've enlarged to 2.75. Uh, we use the pre-dilatation. If there is no major angiographic dissection, then we randomize between magic touch and sequin uh, B Brown, uh, 57 patients in each group. And we do a, an OCT post pre dilatation, basically to have a, a guidance and have a precise diameter balloon to ensure full contact with the vessel wall. And then we will have an angiographic follow up at six months looking at the net lumen gain. Now what we are doing is that we are using the new Murray base FFR, which is taking into account the fractal flow. We are using the machine learning OCT, the OFR, the FFR derived the OCT, and some optical analysis all in the core lab. We are close to the, uh, at the end of the trial. I think it was 102 when I left uh, Galway, and as you could see, we will have also an assessment of the Murray base FFR uh, at the long term. This is the case presentation. It's a, a lesion in a vessel of 2.01 millimeter. MLD is uh, 0.94. Uh, you do the uh, pre-dilatation, and you could see on the pre-dilatation that you have uh, a major dissection there, a pleasant dissection, a therapeutic dissection, we will see that, and we analyze that in great detail. Uh, what we did is that we look at all the frame. Uh, early day with uh, Nieves Gonzalo, we described that as a crater, but the crater, as you could see, is the beginning of the dissection, and then you get this increasing the essence, the essence, so that the drug coating balloon will have a direct contact with the media and the adventitia. Sometimes we see interesting structures. If you look carefully here on the slide 180 to 190, it seems that something is floating in the lumen. That's, of course, not the case. And you see the dissection go on for many, many frames, and finally, you get back to this kind of dead hand here. And finally, you get back to the not normal vessel, but distal vessel. To better appreciate that, you have to do a flying through. You see this uh, uh, piece of tissue, which was, it looks like floating in the lumen. As a matter of fact, if you look at the pi pictures carefully, it's something which is connected to the dissection proximally and distally. The connection proximal is here, and the connection distal is there, and it looks like is this piece of tissue is uh, flying into the lumen. We go one step further these days. We use hologram, hologram that you can use during the procedure, and this is the very simple approach, uh, a 
cross-sectional. You could see the dissection that you have seen, nothing very spectacular. But then you can do whatever you want. Instead to say to the technician, move forward, backward, and so, by just moving your head forward and backward, you could find back this piece of tissue which is in the dissection. Very useful. I can guarantee that this technology will come in the CAT lab in the near future. So, the first question is, will fracture and dissection be present in all cases? The answer is yes. <laughs> I mean, in 55, 55 of the first 57 cases, it is the case, the dissection, the fracture is there. Now, we quantify this fracture with a new software very precisely, as you could see. We, we measure the, the space between the two edges of the vessel. And in this case, the uh, dissection volume is 13.8. That will contribute to an improvement of the QFR. It's a new space. And because it's clean and a good clearance of the blood, you know that the blood is not uh, flying through, but the contrast well. This is the volume, the dissection volume. And I'm very, very curious if the result will be proportional to the dissection volume? That's a big question. Very interesting, very exciting. So you see it can go up to 20, 22 cubic millimeter, but it could be also very small in the range of one or two. So very difficult to quantify that uh, type of lesion. We went back to technology described in uh, 1984 when William Wenz was in my lab. And of course we use uh, video densitometry and etch because to quantify the surface of that vessel is quite difficult. And of course, with angiography, you will overestimate only video densitometry and OCT will give you the good result. <clears throat> and we have proved that, that the QCA by etch is systematically overestimate the real video densitometry. I mentioned the Murray low base FFR, which is a novelty, which take into account the fracture flow ratio of all side branch. And in the first case we have analyzed, this is a baseline of uh, FFR 0.84, post predilatation 0.88, post DCB 0.90, and the great pleasure in this case is an FFR of 91, at six months. So here's the result of the first 54 patients. In blue is the FFR before predilatation, 0.82, a standard deviation of 0.11. After predilatation, orange, 0.87, standard deviation of 0.10. But then after drug eluting balloon, 0.90, we are very, very curious to see the six months result. We didn't see a relationship between the dissection and the micro-FFR. We are somewhat a little bit uh, puzzled about that. So the final question, uh, the edge detection circular area overestimate the densitometric area. You have seen that. There's not a linear relationship. And the final point, this is uh, six months later, uh, this six months later, very nice result. As, fact, as a matter of fact, the MLD is relocated somewhere else now. And this is what we have seen in the first 40 patients. So that's a scoop. That's a scoop, gentlemen. Yeah? Of course, I don't tell you, and I don't know who is the magic touch and who is the other one. But as you could see, we start with an MLD of 0.97. We went to the small vessel to 1.51, and at six months is 1.27. So this is the acute gain of 0.54. Uh, this is the loss. And as you could see, there is an enlargement in 30% and a loss in 70%. So that's going to be an, a net gain of 0.30. I'm finishing by uh, some pictures uh, make with the machine learning. 
I think we have to learn what is the lesion component and how it is, uh, affects the long-term result. This is a technology which is uh, very useful to try to understand the future. And the final pictures, they are new optical technique, but I have no idea of what I see and how to make the interpretation of it. But obviously, there is big difference between backscattering of the light, attenuation, and the machine learning. So the final question is, has the extent and volume of dissection and the direct exposure of the media adventitia to serolimus an impact on expensive remodeling, late lumen enlargement, late gain or loss and net gain? I don't know, but we will find out for sure. Will the tissue composition of the stenotic lesion have an impact on late loss, late gain and net gain? We don't know, but we will find out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. As always, it was a very enlightening talk and a lot of promises, but already a lot of good images, which are gorgeous from the Corelab standpoint. I have to say from the clinical standpoint, I'm not so sure I would be completely happy to leave that vessel like this, but we are learning more and more, and perhaps the answer is yes, and that's why it's a magic moment now to call <laughs> upon Cindy Baraja, because we are transitioning from the Corelab images to the user the person who is using this technology in practice since many years. Sandeep? So as uh, we were mentioning, it's all the OCT images, I would like to show some uh, uh, angiographic images of uh, patients treated. Some of these patients are a part of transfer one uh, randomized trial. So I would like to focus on indications for DCB in our practice and then show some cases, mainly focusing on de novo lesions. So in my practice, we use uh, DCB for restenotic lesions, which is no brainer because we all use it in, uh, in, in our practice. But most importantly for these small vessel diffuse disease, because as we know, we implant long layer of metal jacket here uh, and it invariably causes restenosis in a few years time. And it's very difficult to treat. No matter what you do, it keeps coming back. So these are the lesions are probably best suited to be treated by uh, DCB. And sometimes treating the uh, important side branch ostium, especially 001 bifurcation, circumflex ostium. So these are uh, good uh, cases to treat with DCV because you can't place a stent right at the ostium accurately in these cases. Finally, patients who can't take DAPT for more than uh, a month, we use uh, DCB, especially patients waiting for cancer surgery. Um, skip this part. Uh, so I'd like to show this case. 68-year-old man with crystal angina, diabetic, hypertension, uh, LV function was good, but uh, we had some hypokinesia of the anterior wall of the left ventricle. The angiogram, uh, which was done uh, last year, showed uh, RCA was diffusely diseased, uh, but there was more disease in the uh, PLV and PDA branches. Uh, this is the AP caudal view, which shows left main was okay, and circumflex is diffusely diseased, involving uh, both the uh, marginals. LAD uh, subtotally occluded, um, as you could see, is diffusely diseased throughout, and the diagonal is also very badly diseased. Um, so these are the diseases we are dealing with. Uh, diffuse disease in circumflex, LAD, diagonal, and uh, distal RCA disease. Of course, he was discussed at the heart team meeting, and surgeons were not keen to put a, a bypass graft on the LAD, so we decided to do angioplasty. So the plan was to treat the left system first, and then come back to do the right if we had symptoms. So crossing was slightly difficult. We had to use some uh, CTO uh, kits, but in, and then we managed it. And then we aggressively ballooned uh, LAD and, uh, with a non-compliant balloon. And we also ballooned the diagonal uh, with a non-compliant balloon. So this was post predilatation. Now, it doesn't look nice. It looks still ugly. Uh, especially here, there is a, a dissection you can appreciate uh, in, the, in the distal LAD and also in the, in the diagonal. Now, if this was in a major proximal LED, I would stent it. But here, I was reluctant to put any stent there because it then beats the uh, uh, idea of putting a DCB there or not catching the vessel, as Prof said. So we decided to uh, go with uh, a DCB. So we used long DCB uh, in the LED and also in the diagonal. And proximally, we placed a, a 3.5 by 28 millimeter uh, regular stent. So this was the uh, final result. Uh, again, my practice is not to take too many injections. I do one injection with the wire, and then I take out and do a one last injection two minutes later. So if there is no flow-limiting dissections, I leave it. Don't, don't do IVs. So then we attend, uh, focus our attention to the circumflex. Again, pre-dilated uh, circumflex with a non-compliant balloon. 
and uh, this is post pre dilatation uh, no significant uh, flow limiting dissection so we are happy with this we placed a three recorded balloon um, uh, in the circumflex and this was the final result in the circumflex so this was done in november last year and patient came back for a check angiogram six months, completely asymptomatic at this time, so no need to do any further procedure. So we did the angiogram, and as you could see, the circumflex looks very nice, no significant recoil. Um, and what you'll be impressed with the LAD, um, uh, the, the dissected segment also in the distal is nicely healed. Maybe a bit of recoil there, uh, diagonal maybe recoil in the ostium, but patient is asymptomatic, so we decided not to do any, any treatment here. So this is just a post-procedure and a follow-up angiogram, which... Uh, Probably you can appreciate uh, the, the moldering of the vessel and most importantly, uh, healing up of the dissection. So we had done a similar case literally two weeks ago. So this was done on 5th of May. So I thought I'll show this exactly the same uh, scenario, diabetic, it's a lady this time, diffusely this is LAD. So we again uh, ballooned it, and this is post pre dilatation. Looks better than the other person because there's, uh, there's not a dissection, the distal LAD. So we placed a DCB here, um, and uh, we put a stent at the top end, and uh, this is the final result. Of course, uh, she's coming back in six months for a check angiogram, and it'll be interesting to see how that LAD grows. And this is another interesting case. So quickly, I'll show you this because this is again RCS diffusely diseased uh, all through, including the PDA. So we placed a stent in the uh, main RCA, and in the PDA we used uh, a non-compliant balloon and a long uh, DCB extending all the way to the ostium. Have a look at this. this is the post procedure. You could appreciate there's a dissection of the ostium of the uh, uh, PDA. Now, in many cases, you could argue why don't we put another stent there? We decided to leave because it was not flow limiting. And here, angiogram, in uh, six months or three months later, you see the whole dissection is healed, and the PDA looks much bigger. So this is a classic case where you can leave the dissection, especially if it is non-flow limiting. So that's the uh, post-procedure and follow-up angiography. You could see the difference. Uh, do you have uh, some more time to work yes, on case? Yes, go ahead. At okay. least two, three minutes, please. So this is a third case. In fact, this case has been published in PCR online. Uh, this is more dramatic presentation. Uh, a 70-year-old man with inferior myocardial infarction. Uh, so the angiogram of the left system showed some disease in the LAD, maybe moderate in the mid-LAD, but the culprit here was the right coronary. artery. So the problem with this is it's a very ectatic artery with a lot of thrombus. And you'll appreciate this in the AP cranial view. You could see the, the LADs, uh, sorry, the right artery is heavily diseased with thrombus burden and big ectasia. The problem with these cases is uh, what to do. Uh, you can't place a stent here, so much thrombus burden. Even if you do place a stent, what's the size you're going to take? There's a big size mismatch between the distal and the proximal vessel. So given the high thrombus burden, we decided to give uh, GP2B3 uh, inhibitors. And then we decided to do just balloon angioplasty. So we started with ballooning the uh, important RV branch. And then we also ballooned the um, uh, distal vessel. And uh, this was a uh, uh, magic touch we used for the uh, uh, RCA. And this is the final result. Now, there is TME3 flow. There's a lot of uh, spasm probably distally. So we accepted this result. So patient was given more GP2B3 inhibitors for 12 hours. And then he came back uh, for a check angiogram uh, at three months because he had some disease in the LAD. And you will see uh, how amazing it looks now, the RCA, uh, especially when you look at the AP cranial view. Uh, the whole distal vessels now uh, perked up nicely, uh, no significant recoil, and patient was asymptomatic, so we decided uh, not to do anything here. And again, you appreciate here, that's a post-PCI, and that's the follow-up angiogram. Very nice case. Yeah, very impressive. So... In conclusion, DCBs are excellent alternative strategy when stents are not desired. So in my practice, I use probably DCB in around 25 to 30% of my cases, uh, especially where I work, we have a lot of diabetic patients, so we use them a lot. So we can avoid using long uh, full metal jacket, uh, especially in the current era, we should be avo avoiding caging uh, vessel as much as we can, uh, because restenosis can be very difficult to treat. Um, so yeah, we have had some excellent results uh, with follow-up uh, angiography and postural remodeling, and I've shown some cases, thank you. 
Amazing, amazing cases, right, Mark? Really very, very impressive. The that makes me wonder, Patrick, if you should change the term terminology because I, we keep I calling. Change. I changed. You did already. <laughs> I, I said the essence, the essence. I didn't say the section. <laughs> okay. Because it's PTCA, it's, PTCA effect. it's PTCA effect. It's balloon, balloon angioplasty effect. It's not the ugly dissections that uh, when you see one, I think that we're going to have it to stand anyway. But uh, that, that uh, if you allow me, Marco, Absolutely. just one question to Sandeep. Uh, you know, you're a very experienced interventionist, deal with very complex cases. How do you see the next generation, your fellows, when you train your fellows, are going to be, what is the tolerance to leave beautiful cases like that, not to go ahead and stand, because you have to Hold your hand, not to stand this patient. I think it's a very good point uh, because uh, if you look at most of the DCB data in the literature on, on de novo lesions, the bailout stenting has been 15 to 17 percent. Even in Bellot trial, it was more than 15 percent. It varies. And even the basket small too, the DCB uh, stents was more than 10 percent. So in our practice, it's 7 to 8 percent. So we refrain from stenting because our eyes are trained to give, you know, expect a scent like result. And it takes some time to kind of train your eyes not to put stents. Of course, in my f uh, first few years of practice, I used to stent more. Maybe it was 10%. But now it's very low because I only treat if there's a really flow-limiting dissection or ECG changes or something. I tend to leave. And I kept, the good thing is more we do these cases, more we follow them up, we get more confidence. And that's what I teach my fellows as well. So, yeah. Great point, Sandeep. Actually, I experienced that transitioning in mindset a few years ago when I was forcing myself to use DCB more and more irrespective of SSIs. And I went from a stage in which every time I was in suspicious of the section I was standing to a case in which I would say, oh, I welcome the section because that will probably mean late lumen enlargement. Question to you. There are uh, some of us who are using physiological guidance to decide at which level you should keep pushing the envelope in predilatation and when you should stand and when you should not and when you use DCB. What is your experience there? I have very little experience with the FFR guided or uh, uh, pressure wire guided, but I've seen Professor Colombo does it a lot. Uh, and I think that's a group practice because he puts the wire in and then predilates and only if it's 0.90 uh, PDPA, then he accepts the result. And anything less than that, he either predilates more or maybe puts stents in. The other important thing we are doing now is if we do a long layer of uh, DCB, and if there is a focal dissection, we only seal that bit with a, like a 12 millimeter stent. Uh, so it's like limiting the length of the stent. So yesterday, I mean, uh, I was making the conclusion, and uh, it, that's what he said. He said, uh, if PDPA is above 90, I would, uh, I would accept and uh, no problem with thrombose, which the nose we will see. But I didn't ask him how does he introduce this pressure wire in these uh, yeah. multiple dissections. That's what I cannot envision, you know. Yeah. Unless I, I if have, you leave it. Like. I have the answer, Patrick. It's not using pressure wire, using microcatheter. Microcatheter. Yes. So he's using, he, did, he didn't say that. Yeah. And basically, in this case, now it will be difficult to do dark coating balloon on the pressure wire except in the big vessel. Big vessel, yeah. The other thing what I've noted is that, look, we have had no acute vessel closure in our practice, but yes, a couple of them have come back and we had to put a stent in, so there has been some recoil. But on the whole, I think DCB probably helps in small vessels. Just a question, the last case, you have this quite substantial aneurysma. Yes. Aneurysma. Uh, what did you do with that? Did you give some uh, <laughs> antiplatelet for a long time? So that was his first presentation. So we gave him a DAPT, <laughs> so prasugrel and uh, aspirin uh, for one year. And then after one uh, year, he'll stop the prasugrel. Our practice is that if he starts thrombosing again, despite being on a DAPT, then to go for anticoagulation. Right. Uh, but in that case, uh, I mean, he's okay now. This was done over more than a year ago. So, uh, so far, we have not had any. You know, the... the Kawasaki in the yes. children, yeah, I mean, yeah. they got this aneurysm, and when you recategorize at the age of 25, it's disappeared because they all, you can see on the IVUS, they are filled with, with thrombus, yeah. but with a good outcome. But I don't know in which case they generate problem and in which case they, they seal and close the aneurysm with, uh, with thrombus and then organization of the thrombus. Mm. A technical question from my side, to, to understand whether I'm doing the right thing, because we have a huge experience. I'm using more and more DCB, especially in young patients, where I think it makes a lot of sense not to cage the vessel, as Patrick came out with some years ago. 
With them, I do a sort of a deal. Look, I'm trying to do whatever I can not to stand. If I have good results, I'm going to DCB, but I would like to have a relatively low threshold to have you coming back and have an Anjo six months down the road, which seems to be what you are doing because you are showing a lot of Anjo follow-up. Is it because of case presentation or is it also reflecting your practice? No, no, I think uh, we don't uh, bring routinely for patients. So what I do, I do slightly smart things. So if the patient has had some disease in the LAD, I deliberately not intervene or assess that at that stage and then bring the patient back in three months, which is fine to understand because, you know, you could, uh, so I will bring them back and do it. So that one way to do, and sometimes patients do come back with some atypical chest pain like uh, your patient. So we do it, but deliberate, no, we don't do uh, deliberate angiography unless they're part of a trial like transform one. One question from the audience, would you, would you have considered NOAC given this peculiar case that you have uh, shown with the aneurysm, with the ectatic uh, vessel as a long-term antithrombotic therapy? Maybe, but uh, be I think uh, because it was first presentations, we will see how he does. So if he has any more problem, maybe we could give this uh, rivaroxaban 2.5, um, you know, there is some data now, so maybe we can. But uh, as of now, he's still on prosecutor because it's continued. But this brings me to a very important point. You were going in that direction before. We basically keep repeating the antithrombotic treatment strategy to DCB as we did in stent, but that's a different animal. Perhaps we should restart from scratch and put the zero and see whether perhaps we would need to use different antiplatelet regimen, anticoagulation more than antiplatelet. The history needs to be rewritten there. Yeah, we don't know that yet because sometimes, you know, we might need a little bit longer until the vessel gets healed. Yeah. So it, I think that the, the data will tell us. But uh, perhaps in that respect, like anticoagulation more important than anti-aggregation. Right? You know, a little bit history. I mean, when uh, Andreas Grunzik was starting, he was questioning himself, I'm going to use anticoagulation of antiplatelet. So he consulted a young doctor called Valentin Furster, you know, <laughs> which was an expert in antiplatelet. At that time, there was only aspirin and pyridamol. So you're not going to use pyridamol. So we went to the uh, aspirin at that time. And that's a legacy. And then we had the, the other P2Y12 because aspirin was not enough for the stent. So you're right. I mean, you have to, to start again. Uh, uh, are we so good result? Because we have powerful P2Y12, yeah. I guess it's the case, you know. Uh, in some of the transform patients, you see thrombus, yeah, very clear thrombus. Yeah. But apparently, we didn't pay the, the start the P2Y12 and nothing happened. So that's maybe the big difference with the early days, because in our time, I got at 6 p.m. the phone call, patient has chest pain. That was always five, six hours after the angioplasty. Mm -hmm. we, we ate these things, you know? That's why we jump on the stand, yeah? Now you have to come back to this. Yes. So yeah. it's time to wrap up, yes. unfortunately, Please. because it's a huge discussion and I need to rush as well, because in fact, we are getting uh, quite late. These are my disclosure. I think I can easily go through this one. I just would like to make a point which has not been perhaps enough emphasized. It's not only the stent, it's not only the balloon protruding, but it's also the edge which are covered and that would potentially protect versus uh, edge, uh, instant uh, uh, stenosis potentially. Now we alluded to this major study. I would like to put that on spot because this study is a landmark investigation. That's ability diabetes global study. It's a 3000 patient fully dedicated uh, to diabetes patients. Such a large study in such a very important subset of patients has never been done before. Primary endpoint is TLF and on inferiority basis with potential for superiority testing if no inferiority will be met. And there is an OCT uh, sub-study. The other technology we had the big privilege to discuss about is a magic technology, which is a serolimus eluting balloon. The basic principle actually are the same, so we are just transitioning from stand to balloon here. You see that there is a, a bilayer phospholipid, which is basically encapsulating nanoparticles with serolimus, which are then delivered. And these are the data that Patrick was showing from Pedro Lemos and himself, showing that actually there is a, a persistence of the drug at least until 14 days. We heard about Transform 1. I don't need to go there. We are uh, also in front of us a Transform 2 study, which is a very large study against EES in average vessel diameter. Uh, Alex, if I can say so, in between 2 and 3 if I'm not wrong. And we are testing prospectively, and that study is soon to start, actually what you were referring to before with invasive measure. That's a Titan depth study that I have the privilege to run together with Colombo. The endpoint, Patrick, is not FFR at the end. The endpoint is the change of FFR from 
final PCI to six or 12 months. We want to test that prospectively. This is very quickly because we are running over time, the list of ongoing studies, which is incredible, we discussed that, and this is a list of upcoming studies. So there is a lot to learn from them, and for the time being, I would like to give the word back to Alex for the closing remarks. Well, with that uh, wonderful presentation and again, wonderful cases, this, this is what I really enjoyed about this session, Patrick. It's a mix of uh, you know, theory and, and practice. So I think that to see this new technology in man and to be able to see some of the late follow-ups, mm -hmm. this is incredible. When we think about that in the past 20 years or so, precisely, what, 22, since uh, you came to Sao Paulo for the first uh, Cypher stand, I thought that, you know, this was the state of the art, but I'm very impressed how you can interact with more interesting features to treat complex patients. So with that, I thank you for your attention and for your participation. Very